okay welcome back uh, so we are starting the week three material now so this is the we have finished two week of this course so this is the third week and towards the end of the uh, week two the last module if you remember we started talking about recovery of metals from electronic waste so that's where we will start so so far we have uh, had a good overview of electronic waste management we talked about uh, different ways the waste is being managed what are the health implications what are the chemicals from there and uh, how to find out estimate the quantity of e-waste that is uh, being produced so all those things uh, we looked at we also looked at some of the global issues uh, not only in india but uh, we also visited uh, using photographs uh, some of the uh, city uh, some of the countries in africa so being said all that now the focus in this week uh, will be on say we want to recover this electron we recover the precious metal essentially when we say metals we are looking at the precious metals like gold or uh, silver and copper those uh, what first of all we'll look at what kind of metals are there and what proportion they are there and then we'll start uh, talking about the different processes which is used to recover the metals from electronic waste so those of uh, this is a lot of uh, d discussion goes on uh, in the academic circle also in the industrial circle today is that uh, how to re say we we all know that e waste possesses uh, several precious metals but what are the what how we can get it out what are the process so this uh, uh, lecture uh, this particular week will kind of focus on that so waste uh, is has there is a uh, like there are a lot of concern not only from the government side but also public uh, yeah, people in general people are also worried about so it's a uh, not only the government but the people are also worried about because it has several hazardous material so if you remember in the week one we talked about that the hazardous material is there but at the same time it's a precious material is also there so main options for treatment uh, currently uh, for electronic waste is basically we are looking at reuse remanufacturing and recycling some incineration and landfilling uh, is uh, is uh, is also happening, but the focus. Uh, I, I, I think I should put it in this way that although the f the regulation focuses more on reuse, remanufacturing, and recycling, but due to the mostly informal recycling happening in country like India, we have some recycling uh, taking place. But most of the e-waste uh, after getting some of those uh, recoverable material is being dumped in landfill or I will say even not in engineered landfill it's mostly on the dump sites and incineration mostly happening in an informal sector so these are causing a lot of air pollution issues too so the recycling it's an important uh, subject uh, from point of view of waste treatment but also from the recovery of the valuable material that is actually getting a lot of uh, traction these days how to recover valuable material as I was telling you a few minutes back how to get this uh, valuable material out of e-waste so that's what uh, we'll try to talk about in this particular uh, lecture so it's it's, it's still not like we are not seeing too much of uh, recovery happening and the reason for that is the heterogeneity of the material the waste as if you remember from the week one lecture I mentioned that uh, there are several materials all mixed together in the printed wireboard or on those chips and uh, even the plastics uh, that we have is uh, mixed plastics so all these are causing a because of the heterogeneity it's a lot of heterogeneity of the material so this heterogeneity is causing a, a big problem in terms of the proper recovery so that's uh, that is there and uh, so that's one concern and, and in terms of the different metals what is present uh, we have around 28 to 30 percent copper uh, 10 to 20 percent lead uh, 1 to 5 percent nickel and 1 to 3 percent precious metal which is like silver platinum and gold so these are which is present oh sorry it's 1 to 3 uh, copper is 10 to 20 percent uh, lead is 1 to 5 percent nickel is 1 to 3 percent and silver platinum and gold is around 0.3 to 0.4 percent so if 0.3 to 0.4 may not sound a lot but if you look at the total amount of waste that is generated it's actually a substantial quantity so other is uh, we have plastics uh, and 90 uh, percent bromine 4 percent glass ceramics ceramics can be recovered as well and uh, there is, has been a lot of use of recovered ceramics uh, in different applications uh, just recently i was attending one uh, uh, wastewater uh, uh, treatment uh, workshop 
where they were talking about uh, the microbial fuel cell and also MBR. And in terms of the membrane that is being used, uh, they have been talking about using of uh, ceramics in the membrane. So that's a, a lot of applications of ceramics are also coming up. Ceramics, as we know, is pretty expensive stuff too. So those are uh, so. And other than that, we have several inorganic elements uh, in terms of organic, uh, and then organic compounds are also there in circuit boards like isocyanate, uh, phosgene, acrylic, and phenolic resins. So a lot of these materials are there in uh, in our uh, electronic waste, which has the potential to be recycled and to be reused. So recycling uh, is of, can be broadly divided into three steps. First of all, you take the electronics and you disassemble. So that's your number one task is to disassemble it. So you disassemble the electronics. So basically taking it apart. So if you have an old CPU, you have your several uh, screws are there, you just unscrew it and take it apart. That's your disassembly part. Then, and uh, what uh, is, you try to salvage, so you try to look at the salvaging of the material. So if you have three, four old computers, you try to uh, take those different parts and make one computer out of that. So that's upgrading is also uh, go going on. Like this is also one of the aspects that is uh, taking place. Then refining uh, to get the material out, you use the refining process as well. So those are, we'll, we'll talk about each one of them in a little bit detail in this particular uh, uh, like a lecture. So, in terms of the flow, if you look at how the flow is happening of a schematic flow of showing the options of recovery of metal. So we have uh, in, uh, we have in e to start with, we have e-scrap, the electronic scrap, which is called e-scrap. Then first step is manual dismantling. So you just take it apart, you have use the screws and you take it apart. So that's your manual dismantling. After that, most of the process requires some sort of size reduction. So you will have some sort of crusher and other stuff where you need to reduce the size. Again, size reduction is needed because we are trying to use either physical separation or chemical separation or these, these separations require some sort of reaction or some sort of uh, uh, sieving and other stuff, uh, some sort of a physical uh, phenomena or chemical phenomena that requires a smaller particle size. The bigger particle size creates problem in terms of the working of that. So size reduction, and once the size reduction is done, you can go for physical separation. If you look at the physical separation here, this is very much similar to what you will typically see even in a municipal solid waste MRF. MRF is the material recycling facility. So if you look at the material recycling facility of a municipal solid waste, there also you will see very similar, what the gravity, gravity, why we use gravity? Basically to separate two fractions which has different weight something which is uh, heavier will settle at the bottom, something which is lighter will be on the top, so we can use the gravity separation. Magnetic based on the magnetic property. We can have the magnetic property, electrostatic property, we can make use of that. AD current separation, we mo mostly use for uh, say taking the aluminum out, that's a very, very common way of taking the aluminum out even in a municipal solid waste uh, stream when you try to re re recover that uh, aluminum cans. So, See, there is nothing very uh, fancy here. So all of these technologies that we are talking about in terms of the gravity separation, magnetic, electrostatic, and AD current, these are well-established technology. These are being, uh, these have been being used for uh, uh, quite some time in different applications. Then you have the hydrometallurgy, hydrometallurgy and pyrometallurgy. This is basically to recover uh, different types of different types of metals or electrometallurgy, and we'll talk about one of these, uh, the, like some of these in detail as we get. And the reason uh, what, what we want to do here is to get the base and precious metal, copper, gold, silver, platinum. For that we need this kind of like cyanide leaching and there are different types of me methodology out there. So we'll talk about that uh, uh, subsequently in this particular video or subsequent video. So this is the typical steps. So this, as you see and see, uh, this is what this, this flow chart is what you will typically see in any complete e-waste management system, e-waste recycling or recovery system. So if you are planning to establish a say e-waste recycling plan, these are all the steps that you need to have. Now thinking in terms of the management side, what is happening today? Today we have mostly uh, people are, uh, we, uh, we have this uh, rack pick, uh, I would say informal recyclers, they are collecting the e-scrap, they do this manual uh, dismantling some size reduction maybe, and then they are doing some of these, uh, and here they use a lot of acids and other stuff, creating a lot of environmental issues and all that. 
So in terms of when we talk about the management of e-waste, there is always a discussion on like what will happen to the informal sector. Because the informal sector has been pretty good in collecting the garbage and bringing the garbage to one location. So they have been doing a great job in terms of the collection part. Where they do really lousy job in terms of the trying to recover the heavy metals and other stuff, the precious metal or whatever. So if there is a merger, like if there is a nice marriage between the informal sector and the formal sector, and for that actually some government or semi-government agencies has to come forward and do that. So if there is a merger, and the business model needs to be worked out as well, because the money is made in the precious metal. There's not much money when you're looking at the manual dismantling and other stuff. So if we can kind of have a system where this portion and the portion on, on this side is taken care of by this informal sector. The informal sector does the collection and other stuff and they become the registered uh, collection agents and whatever as per the e-waste management rule. And this portion is uh, this side which is a high tech side which can which has a lot of potential of contamination of uh, uh, of environment if not done properly needs to be managed by formal sector so of course i'm not an expert in terms of the business methods and all that how this business model will work that somebody has to work it out and i think uh, government agencies needs to get involved to make it work it out because unless the government comes in picture uh, many times we are really afraid that government means something uh, like corruption will come, this will happen, that will happen. But at the same time, getting the different stakeholders on board, the people will only learn, they only listen to a government agencies. People will not listen to any other agency because that's we don't have any other option. So we have to have some sort of mechanism. I'll give you an example in terms of Ontario uh, in Canada, where they in terms uh, for the e-waste management program, they have e-waste stewardship Ontario. What that is, e-waste e stewardship Ontario is uh, uh, it's a semi-government organization which whatever is the e electronics sold in Ontario based on the electronics sold from the different companies, they get a certain fraction of money. There is a percentage. I don't know exactly how, what the percentage. We can, there is somebody who is interested can, use, can, can find those out. So, and that money comes to that particular body and that body looks at the e-waste management for the entire of Ontario and it's a semi-government kind of body it's not like pure hundred so one or two government employees and some up some uh, like a non-government employees getting together and but they have the backing of the government in terms of enforcing the regulation so here we have the SPCB or CPCB those organizations are there so within that need something needs to come up or they have to support this kind of organization so then only it will be done like if we just leave it okay our rules are great our rules sometimes are more perfect than what what infrastructure we have but at the same time to implement the rule we need to create the infrastructure we need to create the environment and the government has to make uh, the at least the initiative to do that. So uh, when I say government, I'm talking about some government agency. I'm not talking about the ministry or anything. It's a, some government agency has to take the initiative. That's my point of view. I may be wrong. And uh, if I, somebody uh, uh, tell me that, uh, convince me that this is not correct, uh, I'll be more than happy to accept that. But at this, but based on my experience looking at uh, electronic waste in different countries, uh, like three, four countries personally. Uh, I think this is what needs to happen and uh, again uh, we can always debate on that discussion forum is for there go ahead and say send your view we will be happy to listen your view and then we can uh, go back and forth and have a nice uh, debate on that particular topic through the discussion forum so here uh, as I said the informal sector and formal sector they need to come together and that would be a nice right what is because what is happening today almost 90 to 95 percent, nearly 90 percent of the waste is being managed in informal sector in India. Only 10 percent is reaching to the formal sector. And we have the formal sector, but they are not able to meet, they are not getting enough e-waste, not getting enough e-waste. So they are not getting enough e-waste. Can you think about that? We have a e-waste treatment facility, but they are not getting enough e-waste and the e-waste is going over here. Why? Because they have a nice collection infra infrastructure. They also pay money a little bit. These companies, the formal sector, since they have invested so much money in there, they are not in a position to pay uh, to the regular customer in terms of uh, uh, like 400, 500 rupees for one old computer or a laptop or like that, which the form informal sector can do that. So there is a lot of debate. There is a lot of issues on that in terms of the business, in terms of uh, uh, how it needs to happen. But that 
that discussion has to take place. Then only, unless we start, first of all, for any problem to be solved, irrespective of whatever the issue, we need to identify the problem. We need to acknowledge that yes, the problem exists. Then we can work towards the solution. For everything in the world, solution is available. If, if we sit down on a table and talk, that's the uh, that's number one thing. Identify the problem, sit down on a table, and have a honest discussion. And that can solve most of the problem that we have uh, uh, in the world today. Okay, so let's look at uh, so we had uh, look at some of the details of each one of those. Disassembly means what? We are selectively uh, looking at uh, we take out any hazardous material from there. We single out any hazardous material, singling out the hazardous material or valuable component for a special treatment. So that's an indispensable process in the recycling of e-waste. Upgrading, you can use mechanical processing or metallurgical processing to upgrade the desirable material content, like you can prepare the material for refinery purpose. So basically you are concentrating it. Refinery is you can recover the material or uh, uh, retreat it, purified by using chemical processes like pyrometallurgical process, hydrometallurgical process or biometallurgical process. So those are different processes that are being used. So we'll look at some of these processes in a minute. Uh, so what are the existing e-waste recycling technique? What we are doing with that? We are doing CRT recycling, cathode ray tube recycling is being done. Glass to glass recycling, the glass is being recycled into glass. From the glass, the lead is also recovered. So that is called glass to lead recycling. So the metal recovery is happening, precious metal recovery is happening. Mostly in U European Union and Japan, they are leading the pack in terms of the pre precious metal uh, recovery. Pyrometallurgical and hydrometallurgical processing is going on. Biometallurgical process is going on. There is a recovery of metals from mobile phones. Some case studies are happening on that and uh, that is uh, that is also going on. So if you look at some of these are uh, uh, happening in a uh, industrial scale, some of these are happening in a pilot scale. So a lot of research is also going on in terms of the recovery of heavy metal, uh, recovery of uh, uh, like a precious metal. Recently DST actually had a call in terms of uh, is essentially on this, how to take, uh, recover this precious metal from electronic waste. So that's, uh, so government of India is also getting interested in this particular area, so which is really good. So CRT recycling, what is happening, how it is, uh, what is uh, there? It's a two major constituents of CRT is what? We have the glass and uh, where the, the, the glass components, uh, we have uh, funnel, uh, glass panel, solder glass, neck, then there are some non-glass component like plastic, steel, copper, electron gun, phosphor coating and all those things are CRT. That's a cathode ray tube. What is cathode ray tube? Many of you are, if you are very young and uh, you may not have, uh, though um, we are talking about the uh, like a cathode ray tube which had, say remember those TV which has the long back in the, in the that's your cathode ray. So you had that uh, screen on top and then you have the big uh, box in the, in the behind, that's a CRT. I showed you the picture of CRT earlier in I think week one and also in, with the Nigeria picture of week two. So CRT and also for the monitor, we used to use the CRT there. Nowadays everything is flat panel, probably you're watching it uh, on a flat panel monitor on your YouTube uh, or you're probably you're looking at your phone or iPad, whatever. So mostly we are using flat panel now. So it's, uh, it's, we don't use CRT that much, but it's still, in the, if you look at in the disposal stream, uh, mostly we still see a lot of CRTs coming out because from the old, from the houses and all that, and from offices for the old computers. So CRT in terms of the glass components, it has silica, uh, sodium oxide, uh, calcium oxide, coloring, oxidizing, X-ray proton, X-ray protection uh, components, like K2O, MgO, zinc oxide, barium oxide, lead oxide, and lead is also there. So CRT has a lot of these uh, things present. So in terms of the glass to glass or glass to lead recycling, uh, they, these are the two technology route available at present for the C for the cathode ray tube. So these are the two technologies that is used in terms of uh, uh, in terms of recycling of the cathode ray tube. So in terms of glass to glass, glass recycling, what is done after the separation of metals? First of all, you try to separate the metal, otherwise your glass will be uh, contaminated. You separate the metal, then whole glass is uh, grounded. You ground the whole glass into collets, so small, small pieces without isolating the panel and funnel glass and the set collet is used for manufacturing the new CRT. So you can use that for making the new CRT or any other product. Nowadays, since CRTs are not made that much, so you can use for any other product as well. Disadvantage here 
is uh, because of the unknown lead composition uh, in mixed branding collet. Uh, so, depending on the invariant CRT glass composition, because there are if you have variety of CRT glass, depending on the manufacturer and its origin, you have uh, you can have different types, different amount of lead present there. So, that uh, uncertainty is there in terms of uh, what is coming up in your uh, in your waste stream. See, all of these are becoming, uh, it's, it's a process now. The process has an input. So, any industrial process or any chemical process, when you have input feed has to have of certain grade or certain quality. But if there is a lot of variability in there, so of course, your process will get affected. If you are a chemical engineer, you will probably understand it much better that uh, any process requires certain level of certain certain level of homogeneity in the input. So, if you have a lot of variability in your input stream, of course, uh, things will get affected in terms of uh, uh, your industry performance of uh, uh, in uh, of your uh, of the recycling process. Glass to lead, uh, you in this uh, you try to recover metallic lead and copper for recover from the CRT glass through a smelting process. You have a smelting process. So, recovered CRT glass is uh, processed into the lead smelter, also as a, fill, as a fixing agent. The process is automated, uh, you put uh, an automated process with a high over thoroughput. So, it is uh, you have uh, uh, it is a try to make it an automated process, uh, it can uh, try to make it cost effective as compared to glass to glass recycling process. So, glass to lead is actually comes out to be cheaper, more easy to do and it is uh, overall uh, you can do it in a much uh, faster rate. So, that is what uh, it is kind of glass to lead recycling is also done. So, these are the two ways uh, typically you see the CRT glass is being recycled either glass to glass or glass to lead. So, those uh, in terms of uh, getting the glass out which is actually one of the important uh, component in uh, e-waste uh, stream. So, after you have this uh, glass uh, if you are trying to look at the metal, metal uh, and you think about metal of course, the number one uh, things if you think uh, if you remember your old uh, electronic waste in terms of the metal, you will see the ferrous uh, iron. We remember the old CPU or the old monitor which has a lot of iron casing and a lot of iron things even inside. You have those uh, uh, motherboard, uh, that uh, uh, what is that the CD-ROM and uh, older ones probably will have the zip disk as well or a floppy disk. All of that had a met metal casing in there. So, you will have the main drive in there, but the things will be in a metal metal casing and some of them will be ferrous based metal. So, ferrous component it is uh, it is you can always use the magnet or electromagnet. So, that is a easy part you can use a magnet or electromagnet to get rid of uh, to take the ferrous metal out. For aluminum and copper uh, which separated in eddy current separator, eddy current separator comes in handy for aluminum and copper. So, that is uh, it is used for aluminum and copper, we can use the AD current separator. So, for ferrous we can use permanent magnet, uh, permanent magnet or electromagnet. So, those are you can be used for ferrous. So, non recyclable uh, material like epoxy resin, fiberglass, uh, they are they are also done uh, because we if we can remove those, uh, see uh, if you remove these material they are non recyclable. So, if you remove it and then make it uh, uh, that that in, that increases the value of recyclable material. So that's uh, removal is always uh, helps in terms of increasing the value of the recyclable material. So you, if you do the post separation, uh, uh, it's a it's uh, therefore uh, if if you separate them and then uh, it pro it provides higher metal concentration, higher metal concentration in lesser volume. So there so if you have the higher metal concentration, that means you have the better you can so you can sold it you can sell it at a higher price. So, enriched metal content can be sold at a, uh, to an appropriate recycling facility for further processing. So, you can remove this uh, non recyclable material like epoxy resin, fiberglass and other stuff. So, now you have the enriched metals which can be either recycled within the same plant or if the plant does not have the facility can be sent to a different plant for the further processing and further recycling. So, that uh, is also uh, done in terms of the metal recycling. So, let us look at a few examples of metal recovery process. Uh, so, this is one example uh, again these are from uh, different reports, different countries, uh, uh, different companies uh, uh, details. So, let us uh, we will we'll look at few of those. Uh, so, this one is from Huai Chia Din company 
it's it's a physical separation flow sheet for recycling of a scrap IC board. So it's a looking at the IC boards. So it starts with a primary crusher. So it has primary crusher and then uh, you have magnetic separator after you do the primary crusher that's your first step. So you take the IC board and then you crush it. Again if you remember from uh, excuse me if you remember from uh, the just discussion we had few minutes back we need to crush it to increase the surface area to make it more reactive and then so that it works better. So from the primary crusher we can go for uh, magnetic separator, the magnetic separator will help in removing the iron. From iron, after letting, getting the iron out, we will go to look at, uh, look, at look, we will have non ferrous, we will look at the non ferrous uh, metal, should be non ferrous, uh, not iron, non ferrous metal. After removing the non ferrous metal, we will take it to hammer mill where uh, we will try to make it even uh, more uh, fine powder and the fine powder, again, whatever is the uh, the, uh, in terms of the cyclone, the light dust will be collected because in terms of the air pollution, we have to be careful. Then the heavy material will go again to a magnetic separator where the uh, powdered from the powdered form iron will be removed. Then non-iron, uh, non-ferrous material will be removed as well. Then it will go to air classifier to take a, to, to get rid of the plastic. And from after plastic is removed, we'll take the AD current separator to take uh, get rid of the aluminum. So, okay, to remove, to recover aluminum, I should not say get rid of. So, basically, we are trying to recover all these material, and from there again, we'll go in terms of uh, uh, separation, in terms of getting the copper out, and finally, uh, whatever is left will be the fiberglass and resin. So, some of this, uh, this is how a typical process will work around. The boxes could be different. Uh, this is just for an example. So, you you can have different processes going on. So, but this is how it is all done in a sequential extraction process. So, in a general way, what we can say that they work on a sequential extraction process. You target one particular type of material at first, get uh, remove that, recover it, then target the second, then the target the third, then target the fourth in this way and make use of either the magnetic property, electromagnetic property, AD current separator and all those different uh, potential uh, way of uh, separating uh, different fractions. So, this is how a typical uh, uh, I would say the recycling process works and then the final material that you will you may have to go for some of those metallurgical uh, like a chemical based uh, leaching and all those things as well which we will talk about in the next video. So, I hope uh, this is uh, you are kind of trying to uh, my goal in this particular video and the subsequent few videos is to help you understand how the recycling system is uh, typically works in a in a formal e-waste recycling facility. In a formal e-waste recycling facility, what are the process? So, as a consumer, we also have to understand, we also have to appreciate that uh, these processes does require certain amount of money, certain amount of capital cost to set up. So, that is why to expect that this formal companies will actually initially act, act, will be paying us some money to get the e-waste from us it is little bit I would say we, we our expectation is unrealistic because uh, if you think about in the western world where the e-waste recycling is working in a little bit better way, uh, there uh, most of the places as a consumer you and I have to pay as an e-waste disposal fee. We do not get any money uh, when we uh, get our e-waste, uh, when we dispose our e-waste. In fact, we pay money to dispose the e-waste. So, which is uh, not uh, unlike uh, in Indian contest where we always expect money when we get rid of our any garbage, not, under, not only e-waste for other, other waste as well. So, with uh, this let us uh, uh, close this video and I hope you are having a uh, good time with this course so far. You are following it, you are the course is meeting your expectation. Again, we have crossed 50 percent of the material. If you have any questions, any queries, discussion forum is the place to raise that. If you have any suggestions to for us to help uh, and if you need if you think that there is something you want to uh, you want to have a part of this course, we can try. We cannot promise you right now, but we will try that if there is a great demand of certain part in terms of electronic waste management, which we have not covered in the course and needs to be covered, we can always post some additional videos as well. So, with this, uh, let us close this video and then uh, let us close this module and I will see you again in the next module. Thank you.